All right, so we're going to finish our pre-algebra section going over equations and story problems. And then um, that will be the content of the final exam. It's really not a final exam. It's just a, sec a section test over, um, over algebra. So we're going to cover chapter 11 in your textbook today the equation section. And so we're going to begin with um, what is an equation and then we're going to go through um, how to solve equations and then how to apply those same principles to all equations. Um, in Algebra 1 we are taking a comprehensive semester exam over all of the equations all of the story problems from the entire year, plus the graphing. Why am I able to test them over an entire year's worth of equations? Because basically they're all going to be same, solved the same way. So let's begin with what is an equation. An equation is two equal expressions. So if an equation is two equal expressions, the first thing that we're going to do with an equation is simplify the equations on, or the expressions on each side. So, since an equation is two equal expressions, we will first and always, it's kind of a rule of thumb, always simplify before you solve. So you want the expression on the left hand side of your equal sign to be in simplest form and then also the equation the expression on the right hand side what two things are generally meant in algebra especially algebra one when we say simplify what Getting rid of parentheses. yes so no parentheses in either expression and then combining like terms an additional thing that you can do is you can eliminate fractions so before you start actually doing the equation, actually solving the equation, you will want to simplify the expression on both sides. Okay, And then we can apply the inverse principles, and then we can also um, apply what we could call principle of equality. You've probably heard it before. Whatever you do to one side of your equal sign, you must do to the other. Often you might see an equation pictured as an old-fashioned balance, okay? And so to keep our equation balanced, just like keeping our numerator and denominator of a fraction equivalent, you multiply or divide the numerator by the same number, you multiply and divide the denominator by the same number to keep your fraction equivalent. The same thing will be true with an equation. We have to keep our equations balanced. So whatever operation you do to one side, you must do to the other. So let's start going through some of these. So let's start with an equation. What is an equation? An equation is two equal expressions. Okay, and then some properties of equations. The first property is the principle of equality or the property of equality and then some textbooks will int introduce this as having axioms. The addition axiom says that you can only add, it, that you have to add the same quantity to both sides. The subtraction axiom says you have to subtract the same quantity from both sides or multiplication or division. But it's just easier to summarize it up to keep our e expressions equivalent, we have to do the same operation to both sides, and then we also have the reflexive property of equality. Reflexive. What does that mean? That means x equals 3 and 3 equals x have the same meaning, so we generally like to read left to right so we write it that way, but if necessary, we can inverse to either side and so forth. So equation, equations have to be balanced and equations are reflexive. All right, so then when we're doing our, the idea of keeping our equation balanced, we will always do the same operation to each side. This is a 
uh, equation, two equal expressions, you know if you add one to both sides, the equation stays balanced. And then, of course, you can subtract. You can subtract a number from both sides. We can subtract two, and we're still equivalent. We could uh, multiply by eight on both sides. That gives us 16. We can even square root both sides or divide both sides by the same quantity. We can square both sides. Okay. So when we're working with our equations, we always do the same operation. Whatever you do to one side, you must do to the other. And basically, all of our equations can be solved by inversing the operations around the variable. We want to inverse the operations around the variable. The first principle is additive inverse. In other words, when we want to cancel addition, what do we do? We add the opposite. That's additive inverse. So if I'm solving an equation, let's say I'm solving an equation that has very simple equation. We can do additive inverse first. We can cancel the addition because what we in essence want to do is we want to isolate the variable. We want the variable by itself on one side, 1x equals whatever the constant would be. Then we have multiplicative inverse. Multiplicative inverse has the idea of multiplying by the reciprocal to cancel multiplication, or we can also think of multiplication by the reciprocal is also division, isn't it? Just like adding the opposite is also subtraction. However you present it or however you think of it about it doesn't matter. We are going to isolate our variable. So we will use inverse principles to isolate variables. All right now, I know you've done equations all the way up through Algebra 2 level, so what I want to point out is some principles about equations before we actually start solving them. All right, so these are the inverse principles that we will use in pre-algebra. However, there are two more. Power inverse and grouping. What do you notice about the order of my inverse principles? Addition, multiplication, powers, which would be roots and exponents, and then grouping. It's exactly backwards of what? Algebraic order. I literally am reversing my operations to find the, the value of my variable. So the inverse principles will be exactly opposite in our, the opposite order of the order of operation. So we can use these principles to solve all equations. Um, here is a quadratic. Um, equation that will illustrate all of the grouping principles. Um, let's make this come out to a perfect square, shall we? Sound like a plan? Okay, so I'm going to make it 26. All right, as you are literally isolating the variable. We can simply do the order of operations in reverse to eliminate all the operations that this x is involved in and find its value. And what we do, it's exactly the opposite order. We're going to work our way into the x. 
So we get rid of this external addition first. Then we get rid of this numerical coefficient by multipl uh, multiplicative inverse by division. Then we will square root to get rid of the exponent. Then finally at the very end we'll subtract that one to get it out of the grouping. So when we are isolating the variable we're simply reversing the order of operations. And we are undoing each operation in which this x is involved and we always work from the outside in instead of the inside out. It's exactly inverse order because we are inversing these operations. All right, power inverse, of course, would involve squaring. Um, I guess we'll use x. Oh, let's keep using a. Okay, we're going to reverse squaring by square rooting. And we can even go both ways. And what we will do is last, we will inverse what had been inside the grouping symbol. So this is a quadratic. Remember, a quadratic equation is when x is squared. So what do I do? I'm working my way into the variable, getting rid of the external addition, in this case, subtraction, multiplicative inverse. Get rid of the addition, get rid of the multiplication, get rid of the exponent. Now, we do have to remember what? How many square roots of 9 are there? 2. So we have to remember that I now have two possible solutions. The square root of 9 could be 3 or positive 3. So, got rid of that. Got rid of that. Got rid of that. And now I'm going to get rid of what was inside the grouping symbol, whatever it is, it's addition, so I will subtract it. So x equals 2, or x equals negative 4. So those principles will work on all equations. Um, in your textbook, you'll notice they'll be asking you, is 2 a solution of this equation? Because with equations, we can always evaluate, work it backwards. We can evaluate and see if 2 is a solution. So, is 2 a solution of my original equation? Not something I concocted in here. So, I'm going to do the order of operations backwards. Work my way from the inside out versus working my way from the outside in. They're exactly inverse of each other. So I've got 3 squared is 9. Twenty-seven minus 1 is 26. So to check to see if 2 is a solution, and now we'll check to see if negative 4 is a solution, I evaluate it. Everything I've done here is exactly opposite in order and in, op and in operation. Does 4 work? Is 4 a solution of my original equation? Of course it is, because this time, what am I going to get? I'm going to get negative 3. And negative 3 quantity squared is still 9. Both solutions are equally plausible. So this is a quadratic equation, and it typically has two answers because numbers have two roots, the positive root and the negative root. So typically, when I'm inversing power, I have to take care of both ideas, the positive root of 9 and the negative root of 9. But the, prob the problem here is, or the principle involved here is, do you see how these are principles are going to work every time in every instance? And so, on my high school exam, they're going to have to solve all kinds of equations. How about this guy? Um, let's do equals, um, we'll do equals 21. The inverse principles are principles, and that's why math is so easy to teach. 
Math doesn't change between arithmetic and algebra. We just keep adding to it. And principles don't change. I can solve any equation because I can inverse any operation that may come about. So what am I going to do here? If I am inversing, I'm working my way from the outside inside by doing the order of operations backwards. Inverse. Inverse the 7. Okay? Additive inverse. Oh, I don't want that to come out uneven. I'm going to cheat. How about we make it do that? We don't need a messy fraction, at least not to the end. We will have a lot of fractions with these. What do I do next? I'm working my way into this x. Eliminate the negative 7 by additive inverse. Eliminate the times 2. This is absolute value times 2. Okay. What happens now? I'm to the grouping inverse. What does this grouping symbol mean? This grouping symbol means that the value inside here could be 14, right? Or what else can it be? Negative 14. This isn't the same as positive and negative root, but it's kind of similar. So that tells me that either the, the expression inside will be the positive 14, the absolute value of 14 is 14, but also the absolute value of negative 14 is 14. So absolute value equations typically have two solutions as well because absolute value is the distance to zero on the number line without regard to sign. So 14 and negative 14 have an absolute value of 14. Then what's left? I inverse whatever was inside. I'm working my way finally into um, the inside. So x is 15 halves. Remember, this is algebra. We have rational numbers, not mixed numbers. Rational numbers is how we view our fractions. So the positive side of the absolute value, the positive case gives me 15 halves. The negative case is going to be, it doesn't have to be a negative answer, but it is the negative case, negative 13 halves. Make sure you leave your answer as a rational number, not a mixed number. Because uh, Schoology will be unforgiving with respect to that, okay? Because this is algebra, we use rational numbers. Do you see what I'm, how consistent these equations are? And really, equation, solving equations are kind of the easiest part of algebra. Because what can you always do? Check your solution. Check your equation. So is negative 15 halves a solution? Surely it is, unless I made a dumb mistake. 15 halves is going to give me the absolute value of 14. 2 times the absolute value of 14 minus 7 equals 21. Absolute value of 14 is 14. That is 28. And you can see that this one works. That is the positive case answer. How about I not do what my ninth graders do and actually check my equation, okay? So these principles work, the negative case will work as well because what's going to happen when I substitute negative 13 halves in, I will get an absolute value of negative 14, which puts the equation in the same place as the positive case, okay? So the inverse principles work on all equations. The inverse principles are used to inverse or reverse the operations in an equation, and they're going to always be in the opposite order. We're going to work our way into 
the variable, and so forth. It even works for this guy. Um, we better do a minus 7 so that we can have a nice number here. Inverse that one. Obviously, this is not going to be on your pre-algebra test, but you need to take away some things, some principles about how equations work. Equations are easy. They're all done the same way. We will always work our way into the variable. Additive inverse, multiplicative inverse, power inverse, and then inverse what had been inside the grouping. So here we go again. Same order. Same results. Um, then we will square both sides to eliminate the square root. So x plus 1 equals 9. Inverse the 1 that was inside. x equals 8. Here we don't worry about the negative root because this symbol does not allow it. This symbol means the positive square root of. But other than a few details about how to handle the radical and a few details about how to handle the um, absolute value symbol and a few details about how to handle the square roots, the equations are all solved in the same manner. Okay, so is 8... Is 8 a solution of my equation? Obviously, it's going to be just fine because I will get the square root of 9. 3 times the square root of mine, mine, 9 minus 7 is, of course, 9 minus 7, which is 2. All right, so equations are two equal expressions, and... We have to maintain our e equality as we inverse. We have to add or subtract the same number from both sides, multiply or divide both sides by the same number, square or square root both sides, and then inverse whatever operation is left inside the parentheses, inside the absolute value, under the radical, etc. Okay? Does that work for cube rooting? Sure it does. Okay? So equations are two equal expressions. So when we teach equations in pre-algebra, we obviously are not going to deal with the harder, the harder, um, the harder problems. We will center in with the inverse principles, additive inverse, and so forth. But because our equation is two equal expressions, before we do any inversing, we're going to simplify each expression. So that means three things. No fractions, no parentheses, no like terms on either side. Okay? Even though uh, algebra is done in fraction format, we do not have to deal with fractions in our equations. We can always multiply through by the least common denominator because this is an equation. I can manipulate it however I want as long as I obey the equality idea of both sides. So if I don't want to deal, deal with fraction math, I don't have to deal with fraction math. What can I do? Divide out my fraction. Now there's a little bit of fractions in our, in our book here. Most of them are pretty simple. But let me just show you to illustrate. Let's say I have y over 2, 
y over 2 minus 2 equals 3. I can do the inverse principles. I can add 2 to both sides. And then I can multiply both sides by 2 to eliminate the denominator here. y equals 10. Or I can do the multiplication first. As long as I multiply 2 through both sides. So then y minus 4 equals 6. Either way, and when I inverse the 4, I still get y equals 10. Or you might see an even simpler equation where you have a um, fractional numerical coefficient by itself. For example, 3 fourths of x equals 8. How do you solve that? You multiply through by 4 thirds to cancel that side. So 4 thirds on this side. This is going to give me x equals 32 thirds. Okay, so sometimes we can eliminate fractions um, in Algebra 1. Sometimes we have some very messy fractions, not so much in pre-algebra. Um, your book has an, has an equation that looks like this. 1 and 5 tenths x minus 5 tenths equals 2 and 5 tenths. To avoid making a silly decimal error, I can use the same technique. Tenths, tenths, tenths. I can multiply each part of this equation by 10 to eliminate any worries about, and of course, multiplying by 10 moves the decimal. As long as I obey the idea of both sides, I have to multiply each term through. And then I'm dealing with whole numbers, which just makes the problem at least look easier. And I don't have to worry about making a decimal error. Then I can do my additive inverse. Okay, so subtract five from both sides, add five to both sides. How about I add properly? Divide both sides by 15. X is two. So I can manipulate my equations as long as I keep the equality to make the math easier, to get rid of fractions. To get, these are fractions in a sense because they're tenths. I can get rid of decimals, I can get rid of fractions, and so forth, just by multiplying through by the common denominator. Um, because that makes the equation into whole numbers, which allows for fewer mistakes. Um, maybe here's one in, in your book, two nights, another fractional numerical coefficient, two nights x, Minus 3 equals 5. If I multiply both sides through by 9, I've gotten this scary fraction out of the way. Because that will cause the denominator 9 to cross cancel out of the numerical coefficient. But then I have to keep it balanced. I have to multiply every part of this equation by that 9. Okay, so then I'm going to um, add 27 to both sides. That gives me 2x equals 12, um, 72. x equals, after I divide through by 2, x equals 36. So a rule of thumb, always simplify before solving. So no matter how easy the equation is or how hard the equation can be. You can get rid of fractions 
by multiplying by the least common denominator through, and don't forget the rule, both sides. Both sides. And even this 3 has to be multiplied by 9, and even this 5, they don't have denominators, that doesn't matter. To keep the equation equivalent, I have to multiply through by both sides. Then, if there's any parentheses involved, I will distribute. And then, any like terms on the same side, I will combine it so that my equation is broken down all the way down to two simplified equal expressions. Um, you're going to be doing primarily 11.4, I think. 11.4, let's go over a few ideas. All of the equations I showed you had the x's already on one side and the other expression was just a number. Many equations will have variables on both sides. Here's an example from the book, 6x. Oh, I don't want to do that one, that's number 4. We've got to do an odd one. How about we do... Um, We'll do 5x minus 2 equals negative 10 minus 3x. We have to deal with the negative numbers. There's not going to be any distinction between them. Here we have two equal expressions, and they are in simplest form. The left-hand side, let's fix that. left-hand side has no uh, parentheses or like terms. The right-hand side has no parentheses or like terms. But what I will have to do here is I will start with additive inverse and I need to collect the x's to one side. The equation's reflexive, so it doesn't matter which side you go to, but you typically are going to go to the left. And so I'm going to do additive inverse simultaneously. I want the constant terms collected to the right, the variable terms collected to the left. To move those terms around, I have to use additive inverse. I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides, and if we, we can do this simultaneously and line up our like terms, and then add 2 to both sides. This gives me 8x cancel the x on that side, equals negative 8. Then I can use multiplicative inverse as my final step just to get rid of that numerical coefficient. So x equals negative 1. Obviously we're going to have negative numbers for answers frequently. And negative numbers involved as numerical coefficients frequently. So most equations are going to have x's on both sides. We're still going to use the inverse principles after we simplify them. Something else that causes a problem in junior high is the fact that just because it comes out to a fraction, is the equation wrong? No. What about zero? Okay, the answers can be whole numbers, positive or negative. The answers can be fractions, positive or negative. The um, answers can be rational or improper fractions, positive or negative. And there's also nothing wrong with zero. Um, number 19 in your book illustrates this. And to you as a college student, it should be obvious. What's the only way that negative 7 can equal negative 7 is if the x is gone, is canceled. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with 0 as an answer, though it causes confusion. Even a few ninth graders are still thrown off by it. At any rate, what we will do is when we do additive inverse, we get cancellation on both sides. Go ahead and inverse the x while I'm at it. There's nothing wrong with 0. 
You can have ninth graders leave that. What is zero divided by two? It is zero. Zero in the numerator is zero. What is zero in the denominator? Totally different story. It is undefined. But zero in the numerator is zero. There's nothing wrong with zero as a solution. And as you can tell, if the constants are the same on both sides, the variable has to be zero. So don't be thrown off by zero. Don't be thrown off by um, rational answers or negative answers. There's going to be a variety of them. However, don't convert to a mixed number unless it's a story problem. Okay. If we're doing a story problem, the answer is um, three halves. Nobody says three halves of a gallon. What do people say? A gallon and a half, one and a half gallons. But other than story problems, leave your answers in rational form, reduced rational form for an algebra answer. All right. Then let's do just a few that involve some simplifying. Okay, we've got 3x, here's an example, 3x plus 4 times the quantity x plus 2 on one side, certainly not simplified, equals 2x, 2 times x plus 9. All right, we've got parentheses on both sides, we've got some like terms on the one side, so we're going to and be meticulous yourself so you don't have a dumb mistake, but make your students show their work, make them show the distribution. Then we will combine the like terms. Once we get it completely simplified, then we're ready to inverse. So if we are going to solve equations, we're going to simplify each side, then we're going to inverse to isolate the variable. Get the variable by itself, preferably on the left. All right, so additive inverse can be done simultaneously. I'm going to collect the variable term to the left by additive inverse, collect the um, constants to the right, then eliminate my numerical coefficient by multiplicative inverse. Is 2 a solution? Well, we find out by processing the 2 through the original equation, not any of my steps. Okay, so 6, this has to be done next. Remember with evaluating, I can simplify term by term. This side has two terms, so I will simplify the first term, simplify the second term. This is only one term, and you can see that 2 is the solution of the original equation, not my simplified equation. So we don't check something that we've done, we need to check the original equation if we're going to actually check our work. Last of all, I want to do parentheses within parentheses. You might see some of those. What do you do for parentheses within a parentheses? When we're simplifying, what do we do? We work from the inside out. When we're isolating, we work from the outside in. Everything is exactly in the opposite order. So let's say we have this. 2x minus 2. We'll put a bracket for our outer parenthesis. Um, let's do... minus 2x, um, then let's do minus 2 plus 3x. 
on this side, on the other side will do. X minus two. I'm gonna make sure I copy the same problem and not part of one and the other. Let me double check my copy real quick. I think that's right, we'll see what happens. I'm sorry, I forgot any quite a part here. There we go. I forgot the parentheses. Let's try this thing. None of these problems are in your book, but and we don't do this in pre-algebra, but this is good for your mind. I'm gonna start with simplifying this mess. I'm simplifying, so I work my way in. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two rounds of simplifying. Because guess what, you guys? I am not gonna do negative two through this whole big mess. Don't you do it. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to clear the inner parentheses. This side is easy. 3x minus 6 plus 7, which is 3x plus 1. 1. Still, I'm still working inside. Don't do minus 2 times all five of these. So I'm going to get x3 minus 2. I'm oh, sorry, it's plus 4. Minus 4, okay. Yep. Thank you. So what do we got here? Um, we got 4x minus 2x is 2x. 3 minus 4 is 1. Then I'll clear this mess and catch up with the other side. So, do remove parentheses, combine like terms all inside, then remove parentheses, combine like terms all outside. Then I'm going to Run out of space. What's the answer? Three fifths? Something like that. Move it up. Plus two equals three X plus one. And then I'm going to get five X equals Add 2x to both sides, subtract 1, 1 fifth. Okay, so there will be fraction answers. There will be simplifying to do. But follow the principles of how equations are solved. First thing that we do is we simplify each expression. No fractions, don't have to deal with the fraction math. No parentheses, no like terms. Then we inverse to isolate the variable. And then equations are nice because you can check, but make note to check the original form of the equation, not a simplified form that you've worked on. You wanna substitute your answer into the original problem to catch a mistake that you could have made in simplifying and so forth. All right, so, um, solving equations. Now let's review story problems, and then we'll talk a little bit about teaching them as we do that. So the last thing we're gonna do is story problems.
Equations are pretty easy to teach because you learn the principle of equality that you have to do the same operation to both sides. You learn, you've already learned how to simplify expressions. Then you learn just to do two different inverse principles. Yes, you have to be sure that you know the distributive property so you can simplify. You have to combine like terms. But story problems. Most students have story problem phobia. So let's talk about story problems, and then I'll review some with you for how you can solve them. All right, so story problems. First of all, importance. Okay, story problems are very important. Do not skip them. Okay, you want to have a plan of attack for them. For those two reasons why story problems are important, First of all, preparation for high school. This is intermediate. We're going to need to take Algebra 1. They're going to be taking pre-algebra in junior high. And so you want to prepare them for Algebra 1. So it is necessary to be able to solve word problems for high school algebra and junior high algebra. Right? So it's also necessary to be able to translate a word phrase into a math expression, in particular into an algebraic expression. And another thing, basic translation is not going to be retaught. We're going to jump right into doing the story problems. So we need to prepare our students for Algebra 1. First of all, that's the first importance, to prepare them for Algebra 1. Secondly, develop what? Thinking skills. Um, most students, almost all students, don't like to do a lot of their own thinking. All right, so we want to teach them to, to think, develop thinking skills, and so we can start with thinking through a word problem and what that word problem means and what it's telling us in symbols. So a big part of story problems and story problem prep for pre-algebra is translation. So I want to talk about translation skills. So in pre-algebra, you've got to get those negative numbers down. In pre-algebra, you've got to be able to simplify. You've got to be able to use the distributive property to remove your parentheses. You've got to be able to know about like terms and how to combine them. You need to be able to solve simple equations. And another thing that you've got to get down in pre-algebra is translation. All right, so I've got four ideas here. First of all, translation begins with vocabulary. If you're learning a foreign language, where do you have to start? Is algebra a foreign language? It's kind of parallel to translating a word problem into an algebraic expression. It's very parallel to translating from English to Spanish and vice versa. Most languages, you begin with learning vocab. And then you apply it to be able to translate phrases, don't you? Most languages are translated not word by word, but phrase by phrase. But we do have to start with the vocabulary because words will be translated as symbols. So just like any other translation, we'll begin with basic vocabulary. So we have to know the words for our basic symbols and our basic operations. I'm not going to use the time sign. What are all the words that we can use to mean plus? The operation of addition would be add more than altogether total sum plus 
frequently we're going to be using the words some and more than probably the most and then the word total I think those are the three most common words that we will use for addition subtraction subtraction can be anything that uses the word subtract minus difference with subtraction the two that you want to pay attention to is difference and then we have a problem with less than that we have to address separately when we talk about phrases so primarily with subtraction we're going to be using the word difference and less than divided by we should use the fraction bar in an equation not the division symbol and we will have to use quotient of is the most common of word is going to be quotient of course we'll use the word divide as well parentheses replace the time sign we might see the word product we might see the word times we might even just see of product of times a couple extra ones this one is used a lot twice of course that means two times of course you know in biblical language thrice is three times but we don't see that but we do see twice in common English usage so translation begins with vocab the most important symbol however with our equation is the equal sign and this will always be the verb and usually it's a ver verb of being is was are were sometimes we'll even see equal itself or we'll see su same as the same as so translation techniques first of all begin with vocabulary and then it continues with context we have to put those words into context begins with vocab continues with context once we know what symbols to use with the words in the phrase we will have to put the symbols and the words into the context of the phrase phrases translate back and forth will translate as expressions so we have to put the words in context primarily what we're looking for is order and this is where we come back to the less than so a couple of points here so we have to put the words that we just translated into a phrase in context all right you know the difference between Spanish and English where are the modifiers in English in front where are the modifiers in Spanish and other languages behind so we have to put things in context we have to have some knowledge of how phrases are constructed so we have to have some knowledge about how expressions are constructed for example we have to know how to handle less than um, a couple of you missed this on your homework two negative two taken from five is actually positive seven negative two is going to be taken from five right and of course we'll change the sign and add so we have to put this phrase into context so we can get the symbols in the proper order what if I say two less than a number we'll just use X X two less than X am I just gonna go like this no that's out of context so I have to pay attention to the context two less than X is X minus two less than is backwards so we have to be very careful with subtraction addition we don't have to be as careful because addition is commutative 
the order can change. But we have to put things in context based on what the phrase means so we can put the expression in order. So we have to put it in the context of modifiers, especially prepositional phrases. Then we have to put it in context of proper algebraic order. We can even use a grammar or diagramming parallel. For example, watch this. Two times the sum of a number and eight. Here is a prepositional phrase. Times. Times what? Times the number? No. Times the sum. This is a modifier of sum. So I'm going to be doing two times a sum. So the words have to be put into context of what the phrase is saying. And I could even diagram this, right? Sum It's been a long time since I diagrammed, but hopefully I'm close. Is that diagrammed right? I hope so. But to get the point, it's two times the sum. So this prepositional phrase modifies sum. So it's two times the sum of a number and eight. It's not this. It's not two times the number and then the sum of eight. So context. Seventh graders have to be taught that. Ninth graders have to have it reviewed. So we have to get our translation techniques down. Do you understand what I mean by the parallel of grammar and diagramming? Okay. Then it culminates in sentences. Sentences, of course, are where we really want to be. We're trying to solve a story problem, so we have to have an equation to solve that is associated with our story problem. And remember, what is an equation? An equation is two equal expressions. So when we have to translate a sentence into an equation, we find the verb. It's the key to the is. And then we'll translate the expression on both sides by translating the phrase on both sides of the being verb. Okay? So remember that an equation is two equal expressions, so we need to find the equal sign before trying to translate the sentence. And then we will translate the expressions on each side. Okay? So the key then is finding the verb. Then, of course, capital letter D, it's cemented by practice. So when we're teaching the story problems, we are first of all going to organize into types so that students can recognize common situations. Then we're going to require them to follow procedure, even on the easy ones. Then number three, we're going to give them a thought process to follow, not just steps. Basically what I like to do is give them a strategy to follow and give them questions to ask themselves. The first question we begin with is, how many unknowns are there? The answer is one, then all we do is let X be that one. If the answer is two, then I look for the simplest unknown, okay? Then I look for the equation sentence. I give them questions to ask themselves and kind of a procedure or even a flow chart to follow to help them think through the problem. Give them questions to ask themselves. 
Give them a place to start. Otherwise, they're going to stare at the whole story problem, decide they can't do it, and decide they're just going to leave it blank or put down any old equation and put down a number answer. Okay, so translation techniques begin with vocabulary, continue with context as you translate your phrases to expressions, will culminate in forming a sentence or translating a sentence into an equation and then it has to be practiced. It's cemented by practice. So solving a story problem. I have steps followed by thinking process questions to help them think through. For example, the first thing that we do is we have to set up the unknowns. That means we're going to assign the variable. We're going to assign the variable to the simplest unknown. And obviously, if there's only one unknown, it will be the variable. And then we will actually translate any other unknowns. Okay? And then once we do that, we will translate our equation and solve it. Then the last thing we have to do is answer all questions. Sometimes they'll want more than just x equals 3. They might have two unknowns. We might have to say how many boys are there and how many girls are there. Okay? So. Here's where we start having strategy. How many unknowns are there? We can't just tell, give the story problem and say, solve it. And we can't just do all their thinking for them, set up all their story problems. So how many unknowns are there? Which one is the simplest? Where's the equation sentence? In other words, where's the is? What's the expression on one side? Translate it. What's the expression on this side? Translate it. Solve it, and then answer all questions, not just the single unknown, not just the variable. Okay, so you'll be practicing this for yourself in chapter 11. So there's going to be terminology on the quiz. You're going to name things that are underlined. There's going to be evaluate and simplify equations and story problems. You still have to take the equation and the story problem quiz. Then all those quizzes will all be prepped for exactly what's on the test. Okay, so we'll see you later.